Okay, we just started. Brilliant. Hi, I'm Dr. Wendy Gers, and this is our inaugural podcast for Ceramics Coach. And um, I'm really excited to be uh, chatting today to the amazing artist and curator, Carissa Carmen from the United States. I reached out to Carissa recently in a rather odd way, and I think you'd agree with me, uh, Carissa, it has been quite a strange, well, meeting, hasn't it? Sure. And um, so, yeah, I reached out to Carissa through Critical Craft Forum on Facebook um, with a query about what young curators are doing um, and what specifically around Black Lives Matter and socially engaged curating. As a South African born curator, uh, my practice by definition and specifically working um, through the immediate um, democracy or transition to democracy has always been um, overtly socially aware and um, engaged. It's been a very long time coming within the West, this a sensitivity to, to diversity and to, um, to questions of visibility and, and invisibility within the arts sector. So when I reached out, and, and so this is something that's been frustrating for me, uh, I reached out to see what young curators, who the young curators were and who was doing interesting things in this field. Carissa came back to me and we've started this great dialogue. Um, in this first podcast, um, I really aim to, uh, through Carissa, to inspire artists uh, to engage in critical dialogues while my audience is primarily ceramic artists, uh, Carissa has a very broad practice, a really exciting practice. And um, I believe the questions she raises will be hugely relevant for, for materials-based and craft, as well as studio-based artists. So she's gonna do a little presentation for us and then we'll have a QA. and a Over to you, Carissa. And once again, thanks again. Great. It's so nice to see everybody. Um, I am going to um, I'm going to go ahead and move forward by introducing myself. I'm um, uh, Carissa Carmen. I am a professor, a senior lecturer at Indiana University in Bloomington. I'm originally from California, and I received my BFA degree in um, I'm sorry, my BA degree in um, at Chico State University, and my MFA at Concordia University in Montreal. Um, I lived for numerous years in New York City, and um, I have now re relocated to Indiana University, Bloomington, where I have been for the last seven years. Um, I teach in fibers, um, and fibers is kind of an important, um, is really an important thread of my conceptual and technical teaching, and also kind of an important thread for my sustainability in my practice. Um, I'm going to show a very broad range of artwork. Um, I, I s initially studied sculpture. I studied, you know, casting and doing ceramic work. And I very quickly found out how heavy and hard to transport these items were. And I slowly made my way into fibers where I was, you know, processing paper pulp, processing plants, weaving, recycling a lot of materials. And that sort of ethos of reuse was really important to me and the portability. So that's a thread that has always brought me back to fibers. Um, and, um, and my time at Concordia exposed me to a lot of new media. Um, so I'm just gonna start off um, by showing you a handful of projects and um, they're not in chronological order, but um, my goal is to show you a little bit of how I approach artwork. Um, within my practice. Um, this is kind of a mind map which um, kind of links my interests that begins in craft and making. Um, I began as a young 20 year old thinking about what is caught the cottage industry, you know, what happens when you're making alternative items for sale. Um, and that led me to think about DIY and figuring it all out, the techniques myself, which then led me to say, um, led me to the concept of being a pioneer, of really trying to figure out your own um, techniques or branding, which then led to the concept of low toxicity sustainable practice. 
with that knowledge, the increase in knowing more skills and more technological options became very important. Now you don't always know how to do everything. So that then prompted the notion for collaboration. So the collaboration then kind of opened up two different, very two different sections of my mind, which is kind of the curatorial mind and also a conceptual practice mind. Um, the conceptual practice led to a lot of absurdity. I'm thinking where does art fit into life and which then led me to think about sight. And of course with sight, you're moving around. So that led me to portability. Within portability that made, that thrust me right back into material knowledge. The collaboration also led to curatorial and the conceptual practice also informed my interest in fine art, which then goes back to material knowledge. And then the cycle really starts again. So I really like that this is a fluid cycle for me, but it informs each other as we go through. So the way I've kind of set up my practice today is kind of showing you the title and the location of works and then just a small image of them. Storytelling is very important in the work. So I'll just tell you a small story of what each project is. Um, the Great Speckled Bird is a newspaper project done in Pine Plains, New York. Um, and this was a very small town of about 1200 and um, they only had a, one photocopier at the print place. And so this was um, a newspaper that I delivered to the town over the course of six weeks. It was called the Almost Always Sunday Paper because the printer was closed on Sunday. So if I didn't get it printed by Saturday, the newspaper would come out on Monday. Um, I logged, this is the, on the right is the receipt of me logging how many copies and I um, set up a mail system where I was the newspaper delivery and my goal was to feature people of the town and to start to allow the artists to integrate into the daily lives of the community. This is Household Affairs, which is a, a kind of a very pivotal project when I realized how unnecessary it was to fit into a gallery mold. Um, and this was in access um, to a full ceramics lab and living in, um, this was of course in my very early 20s where I was underpaid, but in a very wonderful creative community, what that was worth it. And so I handmade these tiles and did, we did repairs and installations of exhibiting in the house and we rearranged them ever just so slightly, kind of showcasing DIY, showcasing Skillshare and also kind of showcasing um, the bathroom as a gallery, like trying to figure out like how you challenge where artwork can be exhibited. So even though this wasn't, I would say a quality project, it just opened up my mind to like where art can be inserted into life and how the content to what you're displaying is so pivotal. Carissa, um, was the house project your own personal home or was this uh, a, you know, a shared gallery? How did that work? Um, the house was, we, I was an intern um, you know, at the Women's Studio Workshop in Rosendale, New York, a wonderful book arts collective that was started in the 70s. And we were given the intern house, which was a two-story historic house. And um, so it was not mine. I did not rent it. It was kind of the, the one access of being an intern was this free lodging. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so really hustling and using what you had um, and turning that into a resource um, for selling art or for having an art space. And beautifying it with really low budget, but with really like a lot of ingenuity. So looking at like how homekeeping, you know, it wasn't our home, it was free. We were under, you know, we were, I think we had got, we're being paid like $100 a week, a month, I'm sorry. And so just being like really ingenious was really a, a way of us revisualizing this house and it's like, and beautifying it in a very DIY, but conceptual way. Right, thank you. Even though that project was so simple, but it was a collaboration and it just shaped my entire thinking of where art belongs or where it can be. And so it's a really pivotal project for my thinking. Um, it, that kind of segues into another component, which is very important to me, which is humor. So making, to, um, making which is to keep up with the, and to pace, with the pace of my mind. Um, and this was a collaboration with Cabinet Magazine. Um, and they had this um, exhibition about speed and they were actually curating participants to show um, what your approach to speed was. And this was all done on um, a treadmill. And so the goal was, is that you show up to a treadmill and you perform. And what would you perform on the treadmill? So what I performed on this treadmill to 
to really show my sense of speed was how to build a spaceship and what were the nine steps. And every step I increased the speed of the treadmill. And so I really love that the fact that you can actually find how to build a spaceship nine steps on the internet and really look at the calisthenics of that. So like, it's just humorous. These aren't formal projects. They're like me interacting with an exhibition for curatorial, um, a curatorial framework that just challenges me to try something that I would never do on my own. So I love these creative partnerships. They make me think outside of the box. They're funny. They just make me love being an artist. Um, this was my, um, my award for participating and for completing my nine step, my nine steps of building a spaceship. I was speed reading on the um, treadmill, treadmill. So looking at the ephemera of those performances. Um, also, this is um, also very humorous to me, which is called, um, this is Sand Oak Club. And this is when I was living in New York and I had a collaborator um, who was really into kitsch. And um, we said, you know, in New York, everyone's so busy, you don't even stop and eat a, eat a sandwich together. Like nobody has the time. You're just got to hustle. You're just worried to get to place to place. Why don't we have a Sand Oak Club? So then we could, and every time we eat sandos together, you get a punch, like your rewards card. And so we said, we're gonna have a sando club. We're gonna fill up our card. So we made sando clubs and they were meant for us to make time for our, the people that we care about and people that we love and to make, and for you to get a stamp. And then we did have an exclusive, um, a gold VIP card. And um, these are hand, these are print, uh, uh, these are uh, both designed and photocopied. And then the ones below are actually you know, gold leafed and, and done through a printmaking process. So then deciding to up the value of a card so that they become more specialized. Um, Pet Rock Penny um, is a project that I did in Bloomington, Indiana. And it was when um, I was really trying to navigate the role of how parenting and art work together. Um, this was my three-year-old and I decided to create Pet Rock Penny. And um, Pet Rock Penny was this enormous rock that was meant to go with us. And so I really wanted to see how I would infuse art into my life and how my husband would actually say to me, I wanted him to say this to me. I wanted him to say, don't forget Penny as we're going on a trip. And I wanted Penny to be part of our life. And I wanted Penny to be the pet rock. So Penny is made out of paper mache, which is very lightweight. And so I wanted Penny to go with us on destinations and so that we would show Penny around and Penny would be our excuse for exploring together. So this is Penny, um, pet rock Penny on a canoe ride. Um, I didn't really understand how my artwork is shaped when people say like, what kind of artwork do you do? And I say, well, I'm a fibers professor. But I work in all of the, you know, I work in paper mache and I, um, I'll show you other projects that have, just have a different medium approach. And um, I do, so I was trying to describe what my practice was, you know, it's site specific, but it's not really, um, it's portable, but it's not a textile. I don't have a textile practice. I don't have a sculptural practice. So I really decided that it was site specificity and, and responsiveness. So I often say I'm site responsive. You know, for, um, and that gives me a lot of creative permission to break, to like listen to a location and listen to where I am in my life and where I am in my specific location and, and then respond to that. And that has given me a lot of parameter and a lot of creative license. So this was a, um, a project that I was um, invited to do, which allowed me to really challenge what site responsiveness was. And this was at the Central State Hospital, kind of an abandoned state hospital in Indianapolis. And I was invited to do a uh, work there. And, the, and so I went and visited the site and um, it was an old mental institution for women in the 40s and 50s. And um, I, um, I had never worked with such a like a intent, you know, I would go from being having a humorous practice to having, you know, a mental hospital as my subject matter. And so what I was trying, what I'm trying to do in this project um, is actually to fabricate these garments, which I designed and made, and I gathered these performers and we were there to both have a garments that were both a mix of being a, both a patient, but also being a nurse so that you couldn't actually tell who was the nurse or who was the patient. And we would do items and chores throughout this abandoned building. And 
we would also create kind of strange systems that you could see we, re we were either maintaining the site or we were then communicating with each other and we had um, uh, we were cleaning the floor, we were trimming the grass. This is a system where um, the rags were then pulled up through the soap bucket up to the roof attic where there was a tiny little um, peephole. So just thinking about how we were playing with space. Um, whoops, I just skipped fast. Um, this is um, the water pod project, um, which was an important project as I was kind of leaving New York. It was a large collaboration and this, um, it was building a small like living system with, on a barge that circulated New York City. And the barge really went from different, um, different ports all throughout the city. And it was meant to really um, be an ecological and sustainable living system. I was the living systems director. And so I was in charge of all of the, the life, the living um, plants. And we had chickens, which funny enough, I had to get permission for, um, for them to be on public media. And the, this really became really a portable museum. It became, there was curatorial venues, um, this here is the barge being shipped across. We were all constructing it from scra scratch with um, um, building and, and getting soil, um, soil into the main system, uh, building all of the structures, the toilet systems, the bedrooms, the main, um, the main community area. And um, it was a very, it was a very well trafficked experiment in living on a barge and programming on a barge. Um, this is another um, project which kind of led me to this idea, like here there's so much portability, right? This exhibition is on this barge, which then gets moved from place to place. So this really steamrolled my interest in, in further portability, but like heavier portability. So this really led me um, to a portable sauna, which is also called Sunday Dimanche. Um, and this was in Montreal, Quebec. And this is a portable sauna that is um, meant to go to, whoops, I'll go back. Um, that is actually looks like the small parking meter kiosks that are in all of the parking lots in Montreal. And during the winter, the parking kiosks are very frequented, but it's, it's really the worst job you could ever imagine. You're in this tiny little um, shed, it's, below zero, it's, it's horrendous. So I really wanted to like turn the worst job into the best job, into a job that you can then like revive your spirit. So Sunday Dimanche is my way of having like a religion of Sunday and the Dimanche, which is um, French for Sunday and having your parking lot turn into this refuge, turn into your church, turn into your health, turn into your spiritual cleansing of your sweat. So this had a, a stove inside of it. I fabricated it from scratch. Um, it's on a trailer that can be moved from parking lot to parking lot. And the goal is for you to arrive to a parking lot and to actually walk up to the walk up to this structure and think that you're paying your parking ticket and realize that it's a sauna with a pipe and that it's actually a, like a retreat within the parking lot. Um, Wendy, please interrupt me because I really just have a, like lots of different models of projects. Sure, um, sure. I mean, I love that that project. It's such fun. Um, and I see there's a briefing happening outside. So were, you know, did, were, did somebody explain to, to people who showed up at the parking lot what this was and um, how did people feel about it? I see there's, there isn't really a changing space. How did that all work? Well, um, the, um, the portable sauna actually got moved. So in this, in this image here, it's actually, um, it, it was actually a meeting. <laughs> it was like a formal meeting that we were having at this. And so this is where we are like test, where we are really um, test running the sauna. So two people came out from my apartment into their in their bathing suits. So this was really kind of like a staging of it. Um, and it went to three or four different locations. This is just one image of one of the scenarios. And each location allowed for people and 
people actually went in it with, with their clothes on, like people would walk in and they were invited to sit and stoke the fire. And so it was in scenarios where you weren't necessarily doing a full, you know, disrobing and a full towel and a sauna. I didn't have, you know, towels there. You brought your water, you were at a social event and suddenly you suddenly found this refuge of being in this sauna and then you were sweating and then someone was next to you and you were sweating together and then you were stoking the fire and then it became a lot you know, a connection and an intimacy. And, um, and then people would come out going, Oh, like that, I just went into this, you know, heated cabin or this like heated parking kiosk. And I had this body experience. So I was really interested in also like shifting your sens sensorial experience. And I also was really interested in, in this is kind of goes back to DIY skills is like, you know, building something, an object that worked, right. Technically worked. Um, so also it having to be, it had to be fire safe. It had to be, um, and building it properly. So I was interested in that sort of refined craftsmanship. And at a time when I was living in this tiny little hole of an apartment, I wanted to feel like this was a mansion, even though it was a little cubby. Um, I am very invested in, um, in natural dyes. I, that's something that is really important to me as a fiber professor in my class. And that's probably the biggest tie into my, to my, um, my own art practice. So this is a color collective, which um, debuted at the Textile Museum of Canada in Toronto. And this was, um, again, another variation of site responsiveness where I was in a new country in Canada and we decided to grow colors in Montreal in this small village and this was the location which we were we were um, offered to work with and um, we processed colors um, over the course of two summers we um, pro propagated all of the plants on the rooftop greenhouse at Concordia University and we created um, a, a three screen installation called color rhythm and the color rhythm was was had a very um, important soundtrack which was rhythmic and it was about understanding the rhythm and sequence of color as you're as you're cultivating it so the it's meant to be an immersive environment similar to the portable sauna where you're just in you're completely engulfed in this in this the sequencing of color both visually and auditorily um, this is a project that I'm working on current currently, um, and it really pushes the site component. And so this is called Site Lab, but I also want to kind of challenge what site is. So um, the acronym is then site, um, but it breaks down to surreal investigation of textile experiences. And so this is my way of saying, how am I going to combine site with textiles? Because it's such a field that as a professor, I'm very invested in, I'm technically teaching. Um, and passionate about the information and knowledge that I'm cultivating. So this is another map relationship where I am now trying to build a stronger relationship with my home, which is here at 1201 East 7th Street and this location in Columbus, which I frequent. And so this is a route, it's a 56 mile route. And I am building kind of a, I'm building a sound tour that, that takes me along this 56 mile route. But within that sound tour, I'm finding um, locations of distinct color in which I can stage performative works. So um, this is me kind of looking and communicating different locations where color is a significant presence. And so this is kind of a, st uh, a stage performance where I am finding, I'm, I'm going to a hunting checking station and we are working with hand dyed textiles and, and really processing through fields that mimic the color and gathering color. And these are hand dyed silks, which are also flags and also processing and collecting color from those locations. Um, I'm, I know I'm jumping through a lot of very different projects, um, but my hope is again to just kind of show you the breadth of my thinking and Something that's also very important to me is thinking about being a project-based artist. So I allow myself to jump pretty heavily. So I'm, I can jump from one project to the other and the project is what really creates a distinct par parameter for myself. 
Um, and so there's threads of my thinking that I think are undercurrents. Um, this is um, a project called Surreal Estate, which took place in Sackville, New Brunswick, Canada. And Surreal Estate includes a series of fabricated portable objects and images constructed for fantastical appropriated living in new sites. Surreal Estate collects to make sense of these adaptations as utilitarian data and objects describing the future of discovery. Um, this is a land art quilt. Um, at a time when I was like relocating to a six week residency in New Brunswick, Canada, um, I was really interested in how I was going. I really wanted to do quilting. I like was passionate about sewing. I was passionate about color and I didn't know how I was going to incorporate that into performative work um, or site related work, um, but I wanted to connect them in some way. So this is me um, playing with digging a hole in the earth for the quilt to be for so that for a quilt to be traditionally seen on a wall or indoors or on functionally in um, on a covering for a blanket or bed I wanted to make an outdoor quilt as an honor to land art and I wanted it to be a destination so as if it was a marker flag like a dartboard so if you were an airplane you, you could fly above this and see where your target was like this was a GPS coordinate like this was a location this was in a in an alleyway an abandoned mysterious alleyway and I was interested in property that was not licensed or property that nobody knew who it belonged to and making that location as the site so that people had to find the quilt um, the underside of it is made with a tarp so it is waterproof on the back and I did have to dig the earth and the shape I don't know if you can quite see them but these are cone shapes so they go quite deep. They're about 15 inches to 20 inches deep. And so I had to dig the earth and the exact, um, there's the earth, the process of digging. So I'm kind of creating a map of my digging shape. So making a relationship with the earth by then using it as my armature. Um, this kind of is a combination of both funny and utility. So study of moving is a project in Quebec. And I'm going to show the picture first. Um, this is a collaboration where my colleague who actually, who is, um, is from France and was, um, had studied a lot of body choreography. It was very interested in the bot in just the movement of one's body said, I really want to move large things. Like, can we do it as a project? Can we like, what do you have to move and how far do you need to move it? One, she was like incredibly industrious. Two, I actually did need to move these things and I did not have a car. So it was actually at a complete use. And three, she was really interested in like the dialogue of collaborative moving, the kinship of collaborative moving. And so here we move many things. This is our, this is kind of the ephemera of what happens when these performances take place. So this was a study of us moving um, and we moved a mattress 55 pounds four and a half blocks with no tools and one break. Um, we moved a platform which was 300 pounds on three logs. We moved it 800 feet with no injuries. We moved a huge water tank which was three feet by three feet, a thousand feet with three people, no tools and a lot of thumps. Um, and also an indigo harvest, which was 400 plant clippings, a quarter mile, one altered bed sheet, and 210 pounds. So a total of 5,620 feet, 565 pounds with no injuries. So relocation of objects to new um, locations available upon request. So we were interested in like fusing useful, the use, utility of our bodies into an art form and um, looking at um, how and it was also a kind of a comment on labor. I mean, these are things that you use as a service. You pay people to move things for you. It's Absolutely. a service. And um, in terms of the these sort of pieces, um, well, your previous piece, the tarp, and um, this performative series, are these works ever intended um, to sell? Do you doc do you sell the documentation? Do you sell the concept? Um, what is your relationship with the gallery um, or collectors? Yes, that's a great question. Um, I made a very strong, I had a very strong vision um, that I did not want to sell my work. I, I decided that that was too much pressure. When I did cottage industry, 
work where I was making small multiples additions. I'm a seamstress, I'm a sculptural seamstress. I would, I made hats and artist books. I've made so many things to sell both as utility and some as small artworks. And um, it was a pressure that I didn't li I like. I didn't enjoy the pressure of it um, or the gamble of trying to sell work. Um, so what I decided was that I would, the work I, I wanted to fund my, I wanted my ideas to be funded. So when I apply for work or apply for grants, I apply for the idea to be funded, to enable me to support it technologically with tools to make that work or with permission to hire people to make that work or to cover my airfare to get to that place to make that work or to get a stipend to then go into whatever that stipend needs to go into. So I want my ideas to be paid for. I don't want, and, and yes, I do have some work that has images, but it does, it's not satisfying. Those images for me aren't. And I, I do have a very strong transition in the last, probably in the last six years, mostly based on having a family where I am not physically able to be there. Like I'm not physically able to relocate to make new work. Um, and so I have transitioned very recently into a studio practice, which is object-based. And it's the first time in my 20 years as working as an artist that I, I now have, you know, I have a whole crate of framed works. I have another crate of new works that are framed. I have my sculptural quilt, which I can pack up with the install on it that now I can ship and that can install. So now I've, I've really like just recently re-emerged with an interest in the gallery. And um, I'm also not interested in, in selling that work, even though that's like the antithesis of artists, right? But I think that the more I work, the more I generate, the more ambitious I will then think and then the bigger outcomes. So I'm sure that I will get to that point where I will then enjoy selling work. I'm, I still am more passionate about the ideas. I, I, I agree with you um, on many levels, but uh, I also want to play devil's advocate and say that a lot of artists are intent on living an authentic life and um, exploring areas that are of interest to them and relevant for themselves and their generation. So, so Yes, I mean, I, I see a lot of artists who have turned their back on, on the gallery system and are creating for themselves, um, perhaps rather like you, with the, a longer-term vision that um, in accumulating or in creating a significant body of work um, that will draw or create some kind of traction or energy from the commercial sector. Um, or not, or not. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it, it is interesting to see also how your career has um, moved as you've become a mother and uh, have uh, personal obligations to, to your family. And, and, I, and, and I imagine also teaching obligations which um, impinge on your creative freedom. Um, I, I always knew I was going to teach. I mean, even when I was um, living in New York, I, I was, I taught, uh, I was taught, I was working in natural history museum, you know, I was working in museum settings where I was a teacher. That outreach is so important for me. Um, that, that um, knowledge, you know, sharing is like, it's just so important to my practice. And I knew going into teaching as a professor that that would allow me to make my bread and butter, to make room for my ideas, so that the pressure wasn't 100% of my ideas. Um, I, I'm, at a, I'm at a Research One university, very well funded. I'm not a tenure track position, I'm a senior lecturer, which is a teaching based lecture. So that means that my criteria for promotion and credibility is based on my teaching expertise and not my exhibition expertise, which I think also shapes how I make decisions. Um, um, so that's a scenario that, um, and I, that just kind of shapes what, why I prioritize what. And um, um, even when I was um, 
yeah, so I think it's about the work life balance, like what, what makes you tick and how do you, how, how are you calm enough to be present for your practice? Some people are 100% practice when present when their practice is 100% of their worth. And when their income from their work is like giving them so much confidence, I get a lot of confidence from my teaching. So that then gives me the space to be really experimental in my practice. So for me, it's just that fine tuning. And I've had a lot of different ebbs and flows of where that priority has been and shifted. Um, like I mentioned, and I probably am not showing it, um, my work in gallery, a gallery setting is really, is still really fun to me now. I see it now as more of a creative challenge. Like how can I really like sensorially give activity to the gallery? So my, I would say my first big piece for a gallery was a canvas. I was actually kind of playing off of, I don't have it pictured here, but it's on my website. It's, um, and it's, it's an object, a huge canvas, uh, a huge platform on the wall, which has a hide and seek cover. So the goal was that my son could hide behind my textile work. Like he could actually pretend he was an artwork in the gallery and it was my work that he was hiding between. So I'm not quite, you know, I'm not quite excited by how, I mean, I, I, I feel that the gallery is sterile. Um, and so if I can find a way to activate it, you know, my color installation of those videos was so sensorial. Um, and that's important to me is that you feel differently when you feel the work. You, not just by observing, but you feel it or you understand it. And as I'm talking about my practice today, a lot of the work is about the stories or the, you know, like the parameters of these projects that I set up and the kind of the responses, like that's the fuel for me is, this, those interactions and that really is kind of now called social practice art which now I think gallery curators are like how do we how do we support social practice artwork like what are we supposed to do to make it effective but I kind of want to throw back and say I want it to be humorous like I want someone to come in and laugh or someone to say that's not artwork and me to say yes it is <laughs> so I like I just love that conversation I love people being puzzled by artwork Oh, absolutely. And I'd so agree with you. I think as a curator, um, I, I always see it as working with space and or I see my curatorial practice as working with space and also working with wonder. It's about creating wonder and astonishment and amazement. And when art doesn't, it's just meaningless. And when a space doesn't work to create wonder or inspiration or revolt or some kind of powerful and powerful emotion, and that emotion may even be meditation and Zen, but um, I think they're better places than a, well, they may be better places than a gallery than that. But yes, um, for me, it's about provocative, creating provocative spaces, um, and wonder because you haven't seen it before and it's not obvious and um, when when it becomes obvious and you can take in a space with your gaze and you can sort of say well I've seen it as you walk in and, you, and understand it on all levels it's dead and it's sterile it's when you create mystery and you actually can't say well what is it is she taking that the, the the piss out of me? Is she mocking me? Is this, is this playful or ironic or have I got it or not? Um, or, you know, wow, is this quite, is if something's like super technological, is this, you know, what, what actually is happening there when, 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 when one is out of one's comfort zone, that for me is when, when art and curating is really working. And it sounds like what you 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 you're working on that same kind of um, in that same sort of space. Um, I agree. I um, I still I I still think that um, you know this is what kind of what led me into a cura uh, like I had a quite large curatorial exhibition recently, and it was my you know part of the prompt was you know a few things you know like how do I um, use the gallery in a really innovative way? Because here I'm doing so much performative work. Like how do I embody the body in a gallery, which is bodiless or the, the architecture is the body, but the architecture can only give so much. So like, how do I, how do I use that and, and make it amazing for me? <laughs> 
And um, I don't know if you want me to jump into it, but I have, I do have a little bit of my curatorial exhibition and something that, that was, that, that, that featured for me was how do I, how, how do I maintain a relationship to this uh, fiber area, which is so pivotal to my, my teaching and my making and my ethos, but I challenge it and I use my, my intensive craft knowledge of weaving and winding and spinning and dyeing. And I use that and I interrogate that so that as I'm curating, I have, I, I bring to the curatorial um, venue that knowledge, but well, also- Yeah, I'd love to see some of that and, and talk to you about that um, because I certainly agree with you about um, embodied knowledge and understanding craft processes as essential to curating studio-based practices and um, and, and the sensorial or material knowledge that one, one would like to, to foreground as a curator. And I'll give you an example just from my own practice. And it's an example that, or oh, it was an experiment that never happened. Um, I curated a Biennale recently in China and it was called Contract Earth. And it was really about the materiality of the earth and our, um, our obligations, our social obligations to, to the planet. And um, my pitch was to, to have a clay floor uh, of raw clay with different sort of textures and different amounts of gravel or grog. And in some places, uh, we'd probably need to, to have, um, to have, oh, uh, handrails, because it may be really slippery. Um, but to, to have some kind of experience with walking in clay because it's such a magical experience to walk barefoot in, in clay. And it unfortunately never happened for technical reasons because the Biennale was expecting over a thousand, um, up to 2000 visitors per hour and simply storing 2000 pairs of shoes was a logistical nightmare. Um, in, a, in addition to the fact that it was happening in, in December, it was opening in mid-December and the, the, the cleaning of one's feet after walking through a, mud, a muddy space um, would have also created quite a lot of complications um, in terms of health and sanitation and the museum floors were marble and it was a little bit of a health and security hazard. So, I mean, there were all these kind of complications, but they, the, 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 my hosts were amazing. They actually went to a huge amount of effort to seriously consider the proposal um, and figure out, you know, in, uh, locker systems and drying systems for, for people's feet or just a, a heated underground heat, uh, space for when you came out and you could walk. So it was really fun. Um, and, and I certainly uh, welcome, uh, and I'm sad that didn't happen, but I, it's so nice to see curators who understand or are prepared to, to really under, foreground the materiality. And, and secondly, which, which my proposal there didn't, but the skill involved in craft practices or studio practices? I don't know if I've gone to that much, when I, when I think about the body, like I don't know if I've gone to that much, um, what I would say participation, right? Because I think that that brings in a level of like act, active participation. And so I think that that's a really interesting um, notion of like performative participatory artworks, versus engagement, versus social practice, versus education of, um, versus the body of the technical within craft. So I feel like within body, there's so many subtopics or subcategories of how um, engagement can be come across. And something that, um, that I think as you're talking with um, different, um, different craft audiences. Um, something that was really important to this curatorial exhibition was um, um, as kind of looking about one field. So how curatorial and artist research empowers an understanding of one sensibility for investment in one's field. 
So allowing, you know, anyone that has a lot, a, a huge amount of technical knowledge in a field to be able to then utilize that and find power within it, not just in the technique, but in how you can like deeper a new knowledge within your field. Like that's so important to me. It's like creating a hybridity within the field of fibers. Um, is it okay if I show a few images of that? Thank exhibit? you, that's, yeah. Um, so something that was, um, was really important to me as, and I worked on this with a collaborator and my collaborator, believe it or not, was my collaborator from my first project doing the ceramic tiles in the underpaid job in the house at the Women's Studio Workshop. So tw almost 17 years later, I rekindled this, this relationship with a colleague who is very much into curatorial work present. And, sh and we say, um, how are we gonna make, how are we gonna apply for this craft, um, the Center for Craft, you know, and what, what can we contribute to the field? Like, what do we have to give the field? And I said, it has to be a deep dive, like a deep, deep, deep dive into a technical knowledge that we then conceptualize. Um, that's the only way, like we need to do something that's never been done before. And so what we did was we, um, we read, we were reading, we're really heavy on our research and we, I had been reading the handbook of textile culture by Janice Jeffries at a goldsmiths. Um, and, and I, uh, and I read this chat, this chapter on Thai songet weaving, which I mean, I'm not even interested in Thai weaving, Thai weaving, but I love weaving. So I read it. The, the, what was so fascinating about this article is it broke down the weaving practice in the 17 steps. I mean, sorry, 13 steps. And only one of those steps was actual weaving. So thinking about all the preparatory. So you are then counting, you are then tying, you are then binding, you are then tensioning, you are then, then like warping your yarns. And so all of the body is removed. And then, you, you know, only one action is you sitting down on the loom and you're weaving really tightly really in with, with a lot of balance and concentration. And as a previous weaver, I, re, you know, I realized that you only sit down and weave for a very small component of your work. You're dying, you're, you're designing, you're drafting. Um, and so what we did is we broke the exhibition down into all of the acts of weaving so that all of the artworks were not artworks of weaving. They were actually of the concept of one of the steps of weaving. And so the exhibition is broken down into um, all of those actions. And um, <clears throat> anyways, I'm just gonna show a handful of the works and it allowed me to reimagine the gallery as a really, as a body space of the loom, like a visual loom or visual section. Um, <clears throat> and um, this is just the, uh, the exhibition was called Tie Up, Draw Down. It was at the Center for Craft, which is one of the only real craft um, it's really now become a gallery, but an education center and, and out of Asheville, North Carolina, and they really fund craft research. It's really the only institution like this in North America. Um, and so I'll just read this small excerpt, which is, weaving in essence is defined by a simple structure, the interlacing of horizontal weft and vertical warp threads, yet it is a far more complex process that many people realize. The exhibition explores weaving as a source of formal and material experimentation for contemporary artists. Um, this is um, just um, this is a, just an excerpt of the technical weaving terms, and so um, we were looking at responding to the architecture, which is in this left image, and looking at site-specific works so that works would be made to fit the architecture of the room. We were looking at Sheila. Um, so this is Liz Collins on the left, and on the right is a Sheila Hicks um, Manim work where. Sheila Hicks then takes a portable loom with her to all of her traveling locations and kind of creates weavings based off of the, her location. Um, and this is um, a Polly Applebaum work where she is doing what I would consider to be draft notation. So the, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> the planning and fabrication of a weaving draft. These are made with sh um, Sharpie markers so that when the marker touches the velvet, it actually bleeds and creates these um, kind of bleeding lines. Um, but also kind of the dot matrix of a weaving line and thread. Um, we then also, which is so nice to come full circle, we have a previous knowledge in bookmaking from my time at the Women's Studio Workshop, and we republished this publication um, in a larger edition. So writing in threads, which is the use of poets, then writing poetry in response to a weaving. 
So it's about the dialogue of the visual response, but this is by Francesca Capone. Um, here below you'll, uh, or above, you'll see Lovid, who is a, is a collaborative digital art um, team, and they are looking at, um, at altered patterns from coding. And we really feel like those are, those are textiles, they're digital textiles. Um, the piece below is a Marianne Fairbanks. It is kind of these ideas of prototype and weave weaving. And um, there's this beautiful card loom with a tennis shoe tension below that's kind of dangling. And so looking at experimentation and tension in unusual ways. Um, this is an excerpt from the book looking at kind of breaking down the fiber components. And this kind of goes more into administrative um, programming, which is also inspiring. But um, I just wanted to share that because um, for me, when in, in relationship to the gallery, um, I'm going to go back um, to this image. This is a Joel Baxter piece and looking at like the, lo the logistics and the orientation of using um, textiles as both lightweight, but also screens to divide the room. Um, and there are larger works that are kind of draping from the wall um, that aren't featured here, but just thinking about um, how looking at how we can bring body into the formalities. And this is, won't be the, the end of my curatorial vision, it just is the beginning. So it's just a nice way of getting to communicate with artists that I really respect and seek out works and advocate for them. Brilliant. Um, this has been so fascinating and, and rich. What would, you know, your, your practice, which has started in a house, gone back to a family um, and, and constantly revisiting gallery spaces in, in very innovative and creative ways that interrogate the, the act of craftsmanship, um, I think is, is perhaps threaded throughout your, your career and your, your presentation. Um, what would your sort of advice be to, to young and emerging artists in terms of wishing to develop a, a practice um, that critically dialogues with craft and studio practices? Um, I, I really, collaboration is not for everyone. <laughs> I think I also decided that I didn't want to be a lonely artist. Like I didn't want to hole up in my studio and not talk to people for hours. Like I just knew that that's not important to me. Although I do do that and I do find a lot of refuge, but I usually make in the middle of, you know, I love making at night. <laughs> it's the only time where I have an un uninterrupted un time. Yeah. Um, so I, 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 I'm not going to say collaboration because I don't think that's for everyone. And I think people then force themselves into thinking that collaboration is an answer and it's not for everyone. Some people, I'm a middle child. I love being in collaborations where I figure out how, a, you know, a strange group of people can think creatively and build success. That's not for everyone. But what I do think is a really helpful tool is to like, is like to always show up, to just show up for things, to show up and to like follow a curious thread like of inquiry and to think bigger than you think you're able to do and to like challenge like I love making proposals <laughs> I love it I love for someone to give me a challenge to say can you do this with this institution and this with these parameters I love parameters like and then I, it's like I'm the, the master creative problem solver um, a project that I didn't have featured here is when I was invited to Cuba to do this um, Biennale work and I was like wow this is such an important part of my career I'm invited to this Biennale in Havana this is I'm so thrilled and you couldn't get any supplies shipped to Cuba nothing every every single email where we said do you have this can we get this can we get this wood can we get this paint they said sorry it's not available sorry it's not available and so I did a walking project and it 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 was like trying to figure out ingenuity within those parameters and I think my other advice is, is, and this actually kind of goes into the next slide, which I'm going to go past, which is um, here it is here, um, which is be involved, like be involved in something, but beyond your studio. 
anything that brings a collective voice that allows you to feel like art can be an important job conversation, that this is your work, this is what you're being respected for. Um, so I've worked with College Art Association and this is about making connections. Um, this is an artist that, um, sorry, I'm, I realize I'm jumping. And the reason I'm jumping is because I want to get to this work. So at the College Art Association, which is a national conference, I saw that they needed um, people to, um, what's the word, volunteer, who, who knew, to, um, to apply to be on a committee. And I said, you know, I want to be on a national committee. Like, I just... I feel inspired to be involved. And so I sent an application. I sent a really nice letter, a really fresh, fresh, refreshed CV. And I said, I'd like you to consider me to be part of this committee. And they said, sure, we would love for you to be part of this committee. And I went, wow, that was easy. I'm now on the committee. So I was on this committee with faculty and um, artists from all over the United States. And we got to design programming for the conference, the annual conference in New York City, in Chicago, LA. And I said, great, we would get on these Zoom calls. I was on speaking with people all over the nation and we were programming artists that we love. And so here I'm programming, these are two, they're called the Los Angeles Urban Rangers. And um, what it does is it gives you confidence. It just builds your confidence. Like I could, I could say, I reached out to these two women. Now, one of them is studying architecture PhD in Switzerland, and the other one is working, also establishing a larger trajectory for their work. This is a project where they pretended, not pretended, they staged themselves as, as rangers, as their artwork. I've been following their work for years. This is an older project, actually, and so they're even more interesting now that they've evolved. And I could reach out to them and say, hi, I'm Carissa Carmen. I'm with the College Art Association. I wanna work with you, and they went, I've been dying to get into that conference. I, of course I wanna be in that conference. So also associating yourself with institutions that are notable is so yeah. easy. It's and networks of excellence um, is, is how what I would call it. It's always, you know, get into the best artist residency program. Um, it, it's establish yourself with, and start creating those networks of excellence. But I also, I, I would, I, I'm gonna actually challenge that Wendy because I also think sometimes the non-competitive ones help you give you confidence to get to the more competitive ones. Yes. And so I've had, um, you know, one residency I showed up at, it was a farm to table. I was working a lot with ecology and I, I stayed there for a year and then the director decided to leave and they said, we need a new director. Is anyone available for September? And I said, I'm available. <laughs> also, I mean, I did that all in my 20s when I had a lot less obligations to anyone or anything. And I said, I'm available. And so then I became the director of a residency program just out of sheer willingness, um, fluctuation in a career sh or a job shift and also just willingness. And so then I directed it the whole next year and I met heaps of artists who I still are in, in touch with. So I would say also residencies are opportunities that give you quality time with other artists, whether it's collaboration, it's working on a conference, it's working on programming. Those have been the most fruitful for me, where you're like both acknowledging each other's artistry and you're advocating for each other. Absolutely, yeah. Um, does that seem like a helpful tool? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, fabulous. This has been such a, a, a huge, huge privilege. Um, is that your last image or was there, and, and uh, should we end off on the Urban Rangers? I think that's a really amazing um, yeah. and fun project to, to end off on. Um, do you want to quickly give us a, a sense of where you're going next and um, what your next big project is, Carissa? Um, sure. So um, I am currently wrapping up my sound tour. So my sound tour, and this is interesting because I, um, the sound tour will be featured in a gallery, which is exactly what it's not supposed to be, right? It's supposed to be a portable sound tour where you have it on your phone, you're in your car, and you're driving. It's meant to be an audio tour. So I am now working on like how to then allow this activity that is very site-specific 
to then be reimagined in the gallery. And so I, I'm not quite sure how I'm gonna problem solve that, but I do know that I like the challenge. And um, I'm also working on, on making really active collages. Like uh, that's something that I'm trying to really um, do in my practice where I'm just doing work in my studio daily and actively. And that's something that is, I think, always important. Oh, that, that's, that's wonderful and really, really exciting. When does your show open? Um, it, sh it opens on, in April uh -huh. next year. And um, I have a series of collages that I'm slated to exhibit. So the, those are things that I'm just working on steadily. Oh, uh, really exciting. And look, please keep, <laughs> keep us informed about that. And, and huge good luck with that show. Um, any craft in it? I mean, I guess, well, collages are massively crafted. And I think this division is quite artificial because even a painting is, is crafted. And, um, but anyway, we, we won't go down that, that road. Um, any, yeah, any textile or, or, or studio craft uh, pro uh, projects? Well, when I say collage, actually, like I have like a, a, an object here, it is sewn, like I'm sewing them. All right. Um, okay. What I have is, and I'll just kind of show you, I'm, I know I haven't really delved very much into my studio practice, but, um, or my, like my material practice, but um, these are um, our hand-drawn bills. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you can see them. It's a hand-drawn American $20 bill. Yes, we can see that, yeah. They've been digitally printed. So I'm using a digital printer and I'm hand dyeing and printing on, um, on cyanotype fabric. So I'm making my own cyanotypes and I'm I'll just show you, I have a few things here and I'm just, um, I'm digitally printing my cyanotypes and making dimensional forms. So it's dimensional um, these are patterns that I'm making and I'm just collaging these make, I'm not collaging them, but I'm drafting patterns to then build larger sculptural works. So this kind of idea of the land art quilt is kind of coming back in to say, how can I take the craft of quilt making or the craft of fabric and then shape them into unusual shapes or unusual objects. So but work in space in unusual ways rather than just the obvious divider or curtain or wall hanging. Yeah, so that, that like the, the objects can then have a relationship to a hole in a wall or to some level of color that I see so that they're responding to something, but they can then be artifacts or objects that can be exhibited in a more formal way. And that would be still a positive way of experiencing them. Awesome. Oh, that's so exciting. Um, I imagine you're going to be documenting the process on your Instagram uh, feed. You know, that's so funny. Um, yes. But I also just took a social media break. <laughs> <laughs> it just yesterday. But I do, um, I do use Instagram, um, although I am having a, a, a little bit of a break in an effort actually to focus my efforts in my studio. So also knowing what we need and when we need input and when we need output. So that's a little moment where I said, you know, let's take a little quietness and like just do some output. Um, right. Yes, I'm happy to to uh, update that so that people are aware of those processes. Okay, awesome. Well, Carissa, tons of good luck for, for that show and for the making. And when you do update it, we will, we will be watching and we will be waiting to see those updates. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for your really valuable advice for sharing a hugely rich and interesting and innovative practice um, that is p very, very sensitive to, to materials and to thinking through um, labor, thinking through craft, thinking through process and process and, and, and skills knowledge. Um, yeah, really, really great honor to chat to you. Thanks. And, and we look forward to, to, to hearing more. Well, thank you for having me. And um, it's my just my pleasure. Brilliant. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you.